Hope in the heart of Brahm. 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 We are the Gate Church. Welcome to our Good Friday Reflection. We've got various resources to help you reflect on the cross of Christ and think about what it means for you this Easter. We've got videos, we've got poems, we've got Bible readings, we've got prayers, we've got thoughts for you to reflect on, we've got songs. So we hope you enjoy it, we hope you enjoy it with your family and your household or whoever you're with. We're gonna start by singing this great old song that reflects on the deep love that God has for us. Let's enjoy this song together. as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise. Fountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Float a vast and gracious tide And grace and love like mighty rivers Poured in and from above And hands Justice kissed a guilty world in love. Grace and love, like mighty rivers, poured incessant from above. And hands, peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Isaac lies tied on an altar upon a hill. Abraham loves him, but he raises the knife to strike, to give his son as an offering. But the Lord tells him to stop and gives a ram to die instead. On the hill of the Lord, it shall be provided. Jesus hangs on a cross upon a hill. His father loves him, but he lets the torture happen to give his son as an offering. This the Lord does not stop. On the hill of the Lord it shall be provided. Father, thank you for so loving us that you gave your son, your only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life.
Our reading for today is from Isaiah 52, verse 13 to 53, verse 12. The suffering and glory of the servant. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed, <clears throat> who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgress transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a, sla like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a, por a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This Good Friday, I want to walk you through an insider's perspective on what happened on the first Good Friday. One of Jesus' best friends, John, was an insider who followed the events and recorded them for us, so that we, the reader, might believe in Jesus and have eternal life. So come with me and let's find out what happened on that first Good Friday and find out how John's story of death can lead to our life. So it all kicked off late on the Thursday night, maybe even the early hours of the Friday morning. Jesus had shared his last supper with his friends and then he went to hang out where they always used to go out and hang out in the garden uh, across the road from the city. And, uh, and that night they were joined by an angry mob. Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed. John has already told us that. Uh, and he knew his arrest was coming. Uh, and Judas and the angry mob turn up to the garden to arrest Jesus. But Jesus, does, Jesus doesn't do a runner. He doesn't try to avoid getting caught. In fact, this is how John records it. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and his disciples went into it. Now G Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. 
They were carrying torches, lanterns and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Sounds mental, doesn't it? Jesus knows that he's going to be arrested. He knows he's being betrayed, yet he doesn't do a runner. He goes to where he normally goes to. Something big is going down here. Let's read on. Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Who is this man? Two times he says to this violent and angry mob, I am he. It might sound strange to us, but for a Jewish audience, it would have been unmistakably clear. You see, I am is the name that God used of himself, the God who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Here Jesus is saying, I am God. Yes, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, the one you're coming to get. I am also God. I am he. And that would be ridiculous and laughable if anyone else claimed that. But at the end of this story that John's retold of Jesus' life, of Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead, the incredible teaching, well, this claim to be God carries significant weight. This is no ordinary man, and this is no ordinary arrest and betrayal. Let's carry on with John's story. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the father has given me? Then a detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Jesus is not running or fighting back because he wanted to drink the cup that Father God had given him to drink. He wanted to do his Father's will. He wanted to take the heat coming on us for our sin. He wanted to be one man who died for the people. So this great I am, the king of the Druze is treated like a common criminal. Bound in chain, he's marched from one wannabe to another through the night to be tried and tested. From the residence of the high priest to, to the grand palace of the Roman governor. Each of them trying him, disapproving and rejecting him. A Jewish religious establishment hellbent on his execution. A Roman political establishment committed to its own peace and prosperity and power and ready to crush anyone who challenges that. But what cuts really deep is that laced through it all is the rejection of Jesus by his own friends who are more committed to their own preservation, their own safety than being faithful to him. Listen to how John describes it. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. 
Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what, was, what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. You see, one thing they all had in common, they rejected the king, the great I am. Each in their own way, they wanted him dead. And, and the soldiers and the crowd joined in too. John goes on to explain what happened. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Pilate brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was a day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. With their taunts, their angry fists and their loud shouting, they shout, crucify him. The innocent one found guilty in a court of our own independence and selfish ambition. We've all rejected him. Nobody wants this king to be our king. That's what John writes. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. That's it, John doesn't give us the blood, guts and gore of the crucifixion. In fact, he focuses more of his attention on things going on around him, the soldiers gambling over his clothes, the argument about the sign over his head, Jesus effectively writing his last will and making sure that his mother is provided for in his words from the cross. And that's because it isn't the physical reality of the cross that John wants to draw our attention to, but there's something deeper going on. He writes a little bit later. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus' final cry from the cross was, it is finished. Not I am finished, but it is finished. So what is it that is finished? What well, is that the scriptures are being fulfilled? John has written about the fulfillment of scriptures throughout his account of Jesus' life and particularly in relation to his death. The scriptures that promised that God would send someone to come and rescue his people, to free them from sin and to restore his world to the perfection he made it for. And so Jesus says, it is finished, it is done. It's just like Leonie read to us, that on the cross Jesus took our pain and brought our suffering. That it was our sins that put him there. It was our sins that ripped him and crushed him and tore him apart, our sins. And it is by his wounds that we are healed. God has poured all our sins on him, all our wrongdoing. Everything we've done wrong has been poured on him, the king. And that it was God's will to crush him. It was God's will for him to suffer. God had it in mind all along. The plan was that he would give himself as a sacrifice for us, for sin, so that we might be freed, so that we might have life 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 and more life this is what was finished as jesus gave up his spirit on the cross and breathed his last that all of our sins were paid for and that he could now deliver for us life healing and wholeness forevermore that's why it's called good friday Good Friday finishes back in a garden at night time, Friday night. But this time, 
to bring a dead body, a tomb, and two unlikely followers of Jesus. Let's read from John's account. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus bought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This is in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. These two secret followers of Jesus, full of fear, and yet compelled, come to bury him and to lay him to rest, to show him respect and honour. Of course, this isn't the end of the story. Easter Day is just round the corner with the dawn of new hope. But it is worth us pausing here for a moment on Good Friday, in this place of grief and tears, this place of unresolved questions and the tensions of life as we know it, with these two men who act on what they know and understand about Jesus and show him honour as they lay him to rest. Whilst not every answer is given and every hope is realised, they come and on the basis of what they do grasp about Jesus, who he is and what he's done, they honour him as they come and they bury him. And they are a great example to us. And if we, this Good Friday, in our pain and our suffering, come to the one who gave his life for us, took the ultimate suffering of eternal death in our place, then we can find that we have hope and we have life in this world. Actually, John promised us this right at the beginning of his story of Jesus' life, where he wrote this. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Father God, we thank you that we can speak to you, that we can access you because of what you did in sending your son Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago. Father, we thank you for who Jesus is and how we see his character in John's account of what happened all those years ago. Father, we thank you that when Jesus was arrested, he, his first concern was that it should be him that goes and not his disciples and his friends. We see his selflessness there and we thank you for them. Father, we thank you for his compassion for Malchus, the guy who has his ear cut off by Peter. We thank you that in the heat of this, Jesus is worrying about that. Father, we thank you that Jesus has patience with the man who's got him tied up and who punches him in the face when he's being questioned by the high priest. When he's asked, is that a way you speak to the high priest, not knowing that the person he just slapped is the son of God who's been there since the foundation of the world? Father God, we thank you that Jesus was so patient and kind and good and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, he went to his death willingly, but knowing the cost and the pain. Father God, we pray now that this will not be let, lost on us this Easter, Good Friday. 
I pray that we will know that our Lord is worthy of praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. Times change. Church changes. Trials change the way we relate. Pull us away from each other. But between us and the God who became our brother, it can change the way we worship. It can change the way we pray, but there is no drawing away. Creation groans in the birth of a new age, and in the labour pains we can feel like we're breaking. Faith is strained by the desire to run and the command to stay. But God is here, and there is no drawing away. Christ crucified took on a separation we will never have to feel, a wrath we will never have to face, an eternal isolation in our place. The holy, distant God from far beyond came down, put on our skin, and left his spirit in us to this day. Our grief is his grief, our joy is his joy, his grace is our hope. And there is no drawing away. The mystery of the cross I cannot agonies of Calvary You the perfect Holy One crushed your Son who drank the bitter cup reserved for me Your blood has washed away my sin Jesus thank you the Father's right
thanks for joining us. We hope this has helped your reflections this Good Friday. There's just a couple of things that you know about. Keep an eye out on our social media over the weekend. We've got lots of treats and lots of resources coming out to help you continue to celebrate Easter. And join us back on our YouTube channel on Sunday morning, Easter day at 10.30 a.m. for our live stream of our Easter day celebrations. Let me just close with this verse from Galatians chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. When peace like a river attend of my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast told.
my soul. 